you for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, a joint effort of rehab and medicine and dentistry and et cetera, and teamwork at Delaney. And as Penny said, we have a new team member and I'm very glad to have uh, Dr. Karina Cooper join us. And before I turn the mic over, I always wanna go like, how did this happen? I'm always interested to look back and how did Karina end up here? And really it's dentistry that brought us together. So fitting that this is our first collaboration, I. As I approached rehab, I realized the importance of a well-balanced mouth. And I met Karina in Idaho at the Academy of Equine Dentistry where we both had an opportunity to learn. And I like to observe a room before I jump in. And what I observed was Dr. Cooper commenting and inputting on cases. And then I, as I eavesdropped, I thought, wow, I'd like her to tell me what she thinks about my case. And as the conversation moved along, I learned Dr. Cooper had uh, just finished a PhD and was a boarded internal medicine expert and was just coming off of welcoming her first child with her husband, Alan. And I said, so where are you going to work? And she says, I have no plans. And I said, I do. And this was part of the plan. And so without further ado, I want to introduce you all to my friend and colleague, Dr. Karina Cooper and an introduction to equine dentistry, current techniques and where I like to be future considerations. Karina, to you. Honestly, I don't know how to follow an introduction like that. Thank you so much, Jody, for the kind words. I have the pleasure of being everyone's guide today on the basics of equine dentistry and what we as veterinarians can offer you to improve your horse's health and performance. We're going to introduce some basic concepts and techniques available at this time so that your horse can go from looking like Oops, as I'm sorry, skipped a couple slides there. So that your horse can go from looking like this one here on the left to this one on the right, where we've removed all those sharp points, that uneven wear and those painful ulcerations. To do this, we wanna make sure that all of our pressures are even and we need to use a little bit more equipment to do a proper dental examination and to have better treatment tools available to our, uh, ourselves for better visualization and better access instead of using the old feel technique where we guessed at what was happening in the horse's mouth. Then we also wanted to go and use more precise motorized instruments instead of the classic hand float to allow for precision and strategic treatments. So why do we recommend equine dentistry or floating in the first place? Because oral disease has been associated with pain and indigestion um, with performance issues for some time. And we now realizing that the horses are actually more sensitive than they were once upon a time. So let's start with some basic concepts and we're gonna build from there. Bear with me if you are already familiar with these introductory concepts as we'll be going into the more of mechanical details later on, but let's start with this. So the horses were built to chew grass. They are nipping it and then they grind it. And for this purpose, we have incisors for nipping and then cheek teeth for grinding. Horses also have canine and wolf teeth, and these are often confused. So the canines are found in male horses and in some mares, and they're found in that gap between the incisors and the cheek teeth. They erupt around four or five years of age. We also have wolf teeth, which are a vestigial first premolar that's found right next to the larger second premolar that we find more often in the mouth. Because of this wolf tooth being so small, it can cause some pain, especially in horses that are being ridden with bits in their mouth uh, or trained with bridles. And so we often remove them when the horses are still very young. However, there has been some discussion lately about leaving these larger wolf teeth that may be more anchored um, in the mouth as they maybe do not need to be removed. So don't be surprised if you purchase or have an older horse and they still have their wolf teeth in there. If you do have concerns that maybe the wolf teeth might be affecting the performance or comfort in the mouth, don't hesitate to talk to your veterinarian about removing them. They can be removed at any time. So we know like humans, horses have baby teeth too. And foals are born with no teeth sometimes. And within weeks, we'll actually see the central incisors, the second, the third, and the fourth premolars erupt followed very quickly within a couple of weeks by the second incisors. And then within a few months, we're gonna see the third incisors around weaning time. 
around one or two years of age, the um, adult incisors start to push the baby teeth out. As the baby teeth grow out, they form a cap to protect that erupting adult tooth. So that cap can sometimes get loose and can cause discomfort in young horses, especially those that are being trained. Knowing this, we have this chart that's really handy for any of you that work with younger horses. Maybe it's actually caps that are growing in that might be leading to some of your horse's resistance to training or pain in the mouth. But we don't like removing those caps because they are protecting those adult tooth from development unless they're really loose or causing pain or if they're stuck and causing disease. So gradually over the next four years, all those adult teeth have formed. They've replaced those baby teeth. And as I said, you've got this chart now for future reference in case you have any additional questions. Regardless of if they're baby teeth or adult teeth, the structure and the function of the teeth are the same. They're meant for chewing and grinding and they work in exactly the same manner. The difference is just the longevity in the mouth. And when I was a child first introduced to horses, one of the strangest things I was told to do by my coach was sit and watch the horses for a while. And I learned two neat things by doing that, that the horses don't chew cud like cows do, and that horses slurp water and don't lap it up like a dog. It seems really obvious now, but I was fascinated and obviously hooked. So focusing on the chewing part, horses chew, as I mentioned, by nipping off mouthfuls of hay or grass, and then they have the cheek teeth that work to macerate it. The premolars and the molars have ridges on them acting like a mortar and pestle. The grinding area on the cheek teeth make the pieces of grass or hay smaller and smaller as they work towards the back of the mouth. Those ridges on the teeth and the tongue work in unison actually to move that feed from the front to the back of the mouth. The most efficient motion for the jaw in the horse is down, side, up and in. And we've named them, you know, the down stroke, the side stroke, and then the power stroke because that's kind of how we've related them to when the horse is eating. I've got a good little graphic here, just an animation on the side. It's a bit dramatic, but we're using a skull, so there's no joints limiting mobility, but it gives you an idea of the motion and also the difference in jaw sizes between the upper and the lower jaw. So because the jaws actually are different size, what we get is a difference in travel distance between the upper and the lower jaw. Each time that the jaw moves, the food is ground into that surface and it creates actually a little bit of a slant. And when you take a square and you cut it on an angle, you now have a larger surface area for that food to be ground on, which is quite handy. It's a pretty neat adaptation, I think. So I kept studying the horse and I asked more questions. And I also found that horse's teeth are different from human teeth in their structure. So the horse tooth is really long and there's only a small amount of it that's actually exposed at the top considered a functional crown. And the rest of it is this reserve crown that erupts gradually over their lifespan. And so this is called a hypsodont tooth. With this, we look then at the internal structures of the tooth. So in horses, we need to have a tooth that constantly stays sharp so that we can keep grinding and macerating the hay throughout the entire lifespan. So that's the advantage of having a reserve crown that gradually erupts as the top of the tooth gets worn down. The other benefit by having this reserve crown is it acts as an anchor to resist those incredible forces that are on that tooth as they're chewing on the grasses. So as I mentioned, going into the internal structures of the tooth, we now know that there is a porous dentin core and then a shell of enamel that protects the tooth. That's what we have in humans, and it is generally what we have in horses. That core being soft with a shell that's hard works great when you're eating softer feeds, but in the horse, as I mentioned, we need to have those razor blades there constantly grinding the food over their entire lifespan. So they have enamel actually woven through the dentin to create more of a grinding surface, and that way they can actually chew the stemmier foods. The enamel also coats the outside of the tooth to protect it from the environment and from any lateral forces. When you look on the surface of the tooth, you can actually see two different colors. This image is black and white, but we can use our imaginoscopes for that one too. The bulk of the tooth is a tan yellow color, which is the dentin. And then we have those 
white folds and ridges, which is the enamel. You can kind of see that in the second image here on the slide. So similar to a human tooth, the inside of the tooth in the horse has pulp canals or canals, channels, sorry, I can't speak tonight, that contain the blood vessels and nerve supply to the tooth. And instead of having one or two pulp canals like a human molar does, horses' cheek teeth can actually have up to six per tooth. And they form these horns throughout the entire length of the tooth. So you can actually see the opening of the pulp canal as a black dot on the surface of the tooth. And so we use that as a counting system so we can landmark the tooth. The pulp canal is covered by a dentin coating, which prevents bacteria and food from getting in there. And then on this picture, do you see two little black dots in the middle of the tooth? Those are actually called infundibula, which means funnel in Latin. The diagram, the sagittal diagram up above gives a really good slice through the infundibulum and you can see the funnel shape going through the tooth. It's filled with a dark gray material of cementum and then covered as well with dentin. These infundibula, these are made by folds of enamel and they're completely normal in the upper or the maxillary cheek teeth. And they're also found in the incisors. So neat thing with the incisors, is that we've actually been using the infundibulum and the pulp canals to age the teeth. So when you've ever heard the mention of the dental cup in young horses, that is the infundibulum that we're talking about. And when we talk about the star that we see later on in older horses, that is the pulp chamber that is now being exposed. Kind of handy when you think about it that way. So we went over a lot that's a lot of anatomy and I appreciate you guys sticking with me because this is where the fun gets to begin. The understanding of the tooth anatomy and the structure is how we really understand the wear pattern and the function. So the enamel is hard, but it's really brittle and the dentin is soft and porous. So this means that as the horse chews, that dentin is going to get worn away way faster than that enamel, leaving behind these sharp points and ridges. As they continue to eat, taking these wide, broad strokes on really stemmy feeds, especially, you're going to see those enamel pieces chip away. And so we get sharp points, but they shouldn't form hooks because they should get broken away much more easily. And in the domestic horse, those sharp points are actually even an issue, even though they're normal in the wear and tear of the tooth. And that's because we put halters and bridles on the horses, pushing on their cheeks. And the other thing that we do is we've been feeding them lush pastures and hays and grains and processed feeds, lots of things that are really easy to eat, which means they're not actually chewing the way that they were. Their chewing motion has kind of become lazy and inefficient. These short strokes as opposed to the broad strokes that we should have seen when they're eating out in the wild. Domesticated horses, even on pasture, will still have the same issue because the grasses overall are much more supple than what they were getting on the range. So we don't have those extra forces to chip off those enamel points, and so they get extra sharp and extra painful in the domesticated horse when they're not grazing. So going on to that, we then give the horses hay nets or mangers where they don't have their head actually all the way onto the ground like they're naturally supposed to. And that reduces the front and back motion that the jaw is supposed to have. When you don't have the jaw moving all the way forward or all the way backwards, we start getting hooks and ramps. These hooks and ramps then further limit the motion of that jaw, which locks the jaw in place, making those hooks and ramps that much bigger. So we get this vicious cycle where we're gonna get sharp points on the sides and we're gonna get hooks and ramps on the fronts and the backs. And it's just constantly reducing the motion, which makes those defects that much larger. Worse, those sharp spots can now poke the sides of the cheeks, making the horses very sore, making them not want to move more laterally because it's pushing again against those cheeks. So now they're really not eating from side to side and they're not giving their mouth a chance to actually break off those enamel points. And similarly, when you get the front to back motion, those hooks can get really large and they can start poking into the gums, making the horse not want to force his jaw front to back, making those hooks larger and making other changes happen both in the jaw as well as in the musculature even. So what the side effect is of this is that the horse isn't moving the food efficiently through the mouth if we're not maintaining them. 
And you can sometimes get things like indigestion or worse choke in a horse that's not eating very efficiently. And the normal wear pattern can be accentuated in domesticated horses, as I mentioned, because of the process feeds or because they're not getting access to pasture. You know, some of our show horses live in a stall, so they're eating that soft stuff at an abnormal angle or just not enough. Um, and then we also have aging. So in an aged horse, as that tooth erupts up, all of the enamel that was woven inside of it gets used up. And what you're left with is a polished smooth tooth like this picture here at the bottom. And that tooth is not able to chew anymore. So some of our older horses above the age of 20 can have these teeth that are no longer able to grind. And when that happens, the horses aren't able to chew hay effectively, maybe leading more to choke or more to indigestion. And although that, that uh, eruption and that wear and tear is normal and that an aged horse is going to have smooth teeth, uh, teeth eventually, how fast those teeth get worn out really does get affected by how much pressure is on that tooth at any point in time. So we do have a good chance of helping these guys and improve the longevity of each of the teeth involved. And this talk isn't to condemn how we manage the modern horse, but it's to recognize that in domesticating horses, we've changed their environment and we've changed their food and we've changed their daily activities. When you change things, we now have to be responsible to manage the consequences. And that's how we do it to ensure that they're living their best life. One of the ways that we manage those consequences when we've changed their diets and changed the way that their teeth wear is by providing dentistry to create an artificial wear and tear on the teeth in a very specific and structured manner to balance out all the forces and ensure that those teeth are working as efficiently as possible. And equine dental technicians and veterinarians have been working really carefully over the last 20, 30 years, especially, to try to achieve the best balance in the mouth to fix any of those uh, abnormal wear patterns. And the best way that we have been able to accomplish that is by recognizing pathology better. The way that we recognize pathology better is by doing a dental examination. So the dental examination in the horse needs to be done usually on a sedated horse. Unfortunately, I have not been able to look at the last molars or use a mirror in a horse without the horse gagging. And speaking of gags, I've also never had a horse say ah when I've asked them to. So we need to use a gag or a speculum to get the horse to keep his mouth open. So now that the horse is calm and the mouth is open, I need a bright light in order to be able to see into the deep cave and reveal all the secrets that the mouth has to reveal. I need a mirror in order to be able to see the parts that are on the backside or on the sides of the teeth that I can't get a direct visualization on. And I need to make sure that I have a way to flush the food out of the mouth because especially in horses that have dental pain, they're not moving that feed efficiently and you're gonna get clumps of food stuck in the mouth, obscuring sometimes the pathology that we're there to fix. So after finding these issues, I need to write them down. So just like your dentist, your human dentist, we use dental charts and forms so that even if we aren't able to follow up the next time, another veterinarian can and knows what we saw how we treated it and what we expect to see at that next appointment. And when you follow the tooth along with dental charts, you do a better job of knowing how aggressively to intervene or when to hold the course because things are staying stable. The other thing too, is that the dental chart provides almost like a time machine to see how the horse's teeth have changed over time and to really recognize if there is a change in management or something that needs to be addressed or that's done benefits for that horse's mouth. So that was a lot of anatomy. And we've also introduced some of the expected wear and tear that the horse's teeth are gonna be experiencing with domestication and riding. And we're gonna be now focusing more on how we can fix these things. So now we need to create that artificial wear in a very specific safe manner so that the horse's teeth can be as useful for as long as possible. And I was debating on how to introduce the different techniques available, and I thought that the most efficient way might be in a chronological order. So that's what we're going to look at next. Oh, sorry, did I go through? So the first one that I wanted to discuss today is hand floating. And once upon a time, the farrier was the primary caregiver for the horse. So they took care of the feet, 
And they also turned that rasp around and they noticed that some horses had sore mouths and they would use that rasp to remove those sharp points in the mouth. With that, you're really treating the whole mouth as, a, as one unit, which means you're not being very specific if one tooth is sharper or higher or more worn than the other teeth, you're really looking at them as a whole. In the 19th century, we actually had dental rafts that were made, so they were a bit shorter, trying to be a bit more focused on maybe one or two teeth at a time, or even one tooth when we have very small rafts. And then we also developed mouth gags, realizing that we needed to be able to see into the horse's mouth and we couldn't just keep doing everything by feel. So those got introduced as well. But what about things like those waves or those hooks, things like that? And unfortunately with hand floating and with the uh, gags that were originally developed, we weren't able to see very well to the back of the mouth. Then we introduced sedation and all of that became a much more functioning unit. So using the hand float, we would gag the horse, sedate them, and be able to look to the back of the mouth and remove most of the sharp points that we could find. But we couldn't really address the balance in the mouth. So really only major changes can be achieved with a hand float. And I recognize that there are still some owners out there, perhaps you watching, that prefer hand floats over the motorized floats that we're using more recently because your horse doesn't need to be sedated because they're calm with the float or the horse feels fine after this is done. And maybe because it's what's always been done. And that's fine. I was trained by a previous employer to use hand floats and I learned really quickly what I could and what I could not achieve when using them. So as long as your horse has a very balanced mouth and is comfortable and just needs some routine maintenance, hand floating is adequate. But what if your horse has more issues than that? That's where the hand float runs its limitations. So to address the lack of precision and to deal with the fatigue that you get when you're dealing with hand floating, motorized floats were developed. And there is actually a company that produced a motorized hand float so a hand float on an oscillating motor, um, which is supposed to make them hand float more efficiently, but it really did not address the fact that we're missing the precision with the hand float technique. So more commonly what's used in equine practice nowadays and what we actually use at Delaney Vet Services is the rotary burr. Um, so this is a motorized float and we have multiple different types of burr depending on the teeth or the lesion that we're trying to address, but the most common one is the disc burr or an angled burr. And the nice thing with these burrs is that they're chipped with carbide or diamond, which means when the tongue is accidentally touched or the gum is uh, accidentally reached, it's not going to cause the same trauma as what a hand float will do. The other thing too is uh, the motorized floats have been getting tweaked over time and we've been using them pretty consistently for about 20 years or so um, in equine practice. The manufacturers have been working to uh, improve the rotary head specifically, changing angles, creating an apple core that only takes off a little bit of tooth versus a 45 degree angle that focuses on the tooth as well as the singular or the rough patches on the side of the mouth. And so we can really hone the technique that we're using with the different instruments that are now available to us. And the thing that I like with the disc specifically in the image at the bottom, you can see one is that it's really small. So it's only about an inch, an inch and a bit in size, which means if I have one tooth that is higher than the others or a hook, I can address that tooth very well. And I don't have to worry about accidentally over floating or damaging a neighboring tooth. Now it is still a disc, which means I do still have that entire foot area that is gonna be grinding. So there is still some room for improvement when it comes to precision, but I'm doing much better with this than I was with the hand float that required broad strokes. So the biggest concern with these that I have heard echoed by um, veterinarians, users or dentists, as well as some of my clients is things like the tooth being floated too much or damage being done because of heat. Um, and a biggest issue that comes with any instrument is user and training. Any instrument can be dangerous in a hand that's not experienced or that is not aware of what they're doing. So training is still the most important thing that we can do when it comes to any dentistry. And when used incorrectly, absolutely, there can be problems done, but that is the truth for any float, whether it's a hand float or a motorized float. 
Everyone at Delaney Vet Services specifically, and I can attest to that, has experience in training equine dentistry to avoid these errors um, and ensure that our motorized techniques are as recent and current and safe as possible, providing you all the benefits of having dental treatment without as much of the risk of a hand float that might be taking off too much in a swipe. And as Dr. Santarosa mentioned, um, and it's going to lead into the next slide, it was at one of these dentistry training seminars that she and I met, and we worked together both on understanding the basics, the anatomy, the structures, and what we could accomplish, as much as the hands-on um, skills that we're then bringing to you, our clients, and to our horses. And this is actually what we were working on. So the most efficient I guess, modification that we've done to the equine dentistry is still a motorized tool, but now we're using precision tools. So these are hand tools. So we don't have the torque that you would get from having a battery operated or um, drill power pack. And the heads on them are much smaller. So I can now go down to a few millimeters, half a centimeter um, area and fix that with these hand tools. Whereas with that disc, I was stuck with a larger footprint. Um, so with these hand tools, we're able to do a whole nother level of dentistry and we actually change the terminology and it's no longer floating, it's called occlusal equilibration. What we do when we're doing occlusal equilibration versus floating is we're no longer just caring about the sharp points or the major alterations in the mouth. We're now looking at how each arcade, how the top and the bottom jaw work together and make sure that the balance is even, not that one tooth is slightly a millimeter higher than the others and taking on most of the force pressures, or another tooth might have an excess ridge and might be at risk for a fracture. We're going now down to structural and unity components when we're doing the occlusal equilibration, which is really exciting. I'm still learning this. There is so much more for me to do before I can actually offer this with confidence. And with COVID, all of our training has been delayed, but we wanted to do this seminar to introduce occlusal equilibration to you so that you know that down the road, we're gonna be offering this service to all of our clients. And if your horse needs more care than just a float to remove sharp points and major hooks and steps, we can now go down and offer that to you. So as soon as that's available to us, we will share that with you with bells on, no questions asked. So the big exciting thing um, is all the different options that we now have available to us in terms of the motorized uh, instruments, both the power flow instruments as well as the occlusal equilibration. But I wanted to mention that we also have other instruments that we use on a fairly regular basis. And that would be the x-ray. Uh, so the x-ray tells us the internal structure and how the, the tooth is then working with the surrounding bone. And if we're worried about things like abscesses or periodontal disease and loosening of those teeth, we can use the x-ray to define more about how that tooth is sitting in the bone. And if what we're seeing grossly is actually causing the problems that we're seeing in the mouth. We also use dental picks and probes, as you can see in the second image, to really see if there's feed getting pushed up beside the gum. Just like humans, gingivitis is a big problem in horses um, and it's caused by an inefficient movement of the hay going from front to back. Even healthy horses that have had their teeth floated a thousand times are still succumbing to this. So we use the probe to give us a better understanding of how much gum recession or pockets that there might be. And the last one that I wanted to address is water picks or diastema cleaning instruments. A diastema is a gap between the teeth. Think about the largest piece of popcorn that you've ever eaten getting stuck between your teeth and then somebody saying that you had to stay like that for six months. It is very, very painful and it is the number one thing that in my short time here at Delaney Vet Services I have seen causing severe oral pain in horses. And once you get that popcorn kernel out of there, the horse can start healing and the mouth is not nearly as painful. We need to catch these early and the way that we treat them is by cleaning them out. We're essentially flossing your horse's teeth for you. So as I mentioned at the beginning and we're gonna kind of recap it here, the goal of dentistry, no matter what we're doing is to try to ensure your horse's mouth is as healthy as possible 
as functional as possible and pain-free. We want your horse's teeth to not be the 22 year old that's got polished teeth that can no longer grind. We want them to be the 30 year old that still has a grinding surface, that, that rare unicorn. That's what we're striving to provide you and to provide your horses. We also understand that the performance of your horse can be modified um, or, or can suffer if there's pain in the mouth. So we want to make sure that we're supporting their performance and giving them the optimal chances not to be thinking about that popcorn kernel between their teeth, but to be focusing on the job that they're doing. The other thing too is that just like anything else, if we leave a dental disease too long, we then get secondary problems from tooth fractures, or as I alluded to, we can get infections to the tooth root. You may have heard of things like sinus infections that can happen because the horse's teeth actually communicate with the sinuses. And so we wanna prevent all of that. And routine dentistry, or at least routine dental examination is how we achieve that. And then on top of everything else, we wanna make sure that your horses are healthy from nose to tail. And that means that they need to be able to chew and digest efficiently. And the best way to do that is to make sure that their teeth are working so that the rest of their body can work as well. We've covered a lot today and uh, you know, we've, we've kind of blasted through this a little bit, but I wanted to give you guys a good overview of all the different pieces in the horse's mouth. And as I kind of glancingly alluded to, the mouth can actually relate to the rest of the body. And I wanted to pass this on to Dr. Santa Rosa who introduced me to the world of the stomata nathic system. That's a big scrabble word for everybody who is watching today, but essentially it means that the issues in the mouth can affect the way the mechanics of the entire body are going. It's fascinating, but I'm still learning about this. So I'm gonna pass it on to Jody to introduce you to this concept and to touch base on other things that the tooth and the mouth can do. Thanks so much, Jody, for having me. Great work. Uh, thank you, buddy. Um, yeah, you know, I, I thought it was really interesting as we approached this, this talk. I'm a aficionado of old veterinary textbooks. And so I went through my collection and I wanted to see in 1857, what did we say about horse teeth? And there was the only, the introduction was RAS, right? And still that tie, like you say, to the trimmer. And even in the very last text I have, which is about 1935, 34, the word is float. Um, I do think occlusal equilibration is probably what we're going to see over our lifetime in practice. And it's essentially this stomatonathic system, the reason why I think dental practice will continue to move into, into this realm. You know, the word first struck me when I was in Florida in about 2012, starting my training as a rehab practitioner. So from a mindset of a physiotherapist um, approaching these these magnificent horses. Um, but I remember hearing the word stomatonathic system and thinking, oh, I missed that in vet school. That, this must be a new thing. And I, I called the smartest person I know, my sister. And I'm like, is this stomatonathic system new? And she's like, no, you, you missed that class. And I said, oh, I missed that class. But it sent me down the rabbit hole as things do. Cause when I hear something I've never heard before it captivates my attention. And recently I gave a little presentation about the stomatonathic system and I found it very difficult to embrace the complexity of it until somebody presented this idea, this image here to me of the intricate network of gears that must sync in perfect rhythm for the system to function. And so in terms of the horse, the stomatonathic system is essentially an anatomical system and it compromises of the bone, the teeth, the jaw and all the associated soft tissue. So we're talking about blood vessels, lymphatics, nerves, and my favorite tissue, fascia. Now, the crazy thing about this system is we recognize it in horses because I think we need to extrapolate from other animals which are similar. And so I'm gonna just look at some of the things that we know so you can appreciate the, the relevance. And I'm not gonna to go too much in because we are planning a rehab seminar talking a little bit more about this. But for example, if we look to human literature and what the PTs know about the masseter muscle, this big cheek chewing muscle, they know that, and any woman who's had a baby, if you're pushing, they also tell you tension in this muscle will affect tension through to your pelvic mechanics. 
I, I tell Dr. Shoemaker at times that when we relieve tension in the jaw, we will inject less hawk joints because it's a mechanical system. The other part of the stomatonathic system, which I find fascinating is the temporal mandibular joint. And though we don't exactly recognize temporal mandibular disease in high prevalence in horses, I wonder if perhaps we're under, underestimating some of these very subtle changes that can happen in the restrictions of the joints. And what I mean by this is this tight tissue, this fascia that holds this joint is rich in proprioceptive cells, meaning your, your nerve cells that give you feedback into your environment. I refer to the TMJ as the landing gear for the front feet. And so I wonder in horses who have TMJ stiffness and pain, it goes down their neck. How is that affecting a lameness or a discomfort? So when I considered the dentistry piece and you know something Karina said, I, I can remember in vet school, I knew two things for sure. I didn't wanna to go to the racetrack. I spent 15 years there and I wasn't gonna do dentistry. I wanna be a dentist because I can sit in my stool when I'm 87, give me a horse, right? But here's the thing. When I went there, I really in Idaho began to understand how these very slight mechanical issues, pressure affect the entire horse. So I won't go too much down the rabbit hole more of the stomatonathic system, but I wanna leave you with this one point. An abnormality, the thickness of a piece of paper can cause equilibration, unevenness, balance changes in people. It's why your dentist asks you to bite on the paper if you've ever had work done. And I suspect after the anatomy review that horses likely have a similar thing. So we're talking about the advanced part of the, the kind of the nuances of the stomatonathic system and the importance of, of occlusal equilibration in that. But we still come back to dentistry, not just as performance, but as general health and wellness. And, and these are really some of the, the signs you will see in your horse if there's an indication of pathology or something abnormal in that mouth. You might see your horse dropping feed, which we call quitting. And so we see this bite of hay here in this picture that or grass that's had a chance to kind of move down, but it gets to a point where maybe it's painful, maybe it's sore, maybe it's abscessing. They can't and they drop that. We see sometimes bad breath and there are some things that don't leave you, feet, teeth and sheath. And feet, I smell, you smell it. And it's because of the bacteria that are, that are growing. You just, you get to know that smell. I was in a barn the other day, somebody has a rotten tooth, I could smell it. Um, abnormal chewing or mouth gapping. And this is the beauty and I, I like Karina said, her, her first coach, how perceptive, go out and observe. And, you know, as I was saying to clients all the time, my favorite thing at the end of the day is just to listen to the horses in the barn chewing. You can hear squeaks, you can hear grabs, you can hear crunchings, or you might see that they're moving asymmetrically uneven, or they're only doing that power stroke on the right side or the left side. We sometimes see weight loss. And in the case of some of these diastemas, that space where that food gets really packed in there, that weight loss can be dramatic. Again, coming back to smells and outward, sometimes again, we'll see a nasal discharge. And more sometimes, depending if it's in the sinus when they put their head down, or sometimes we'll even see an abscessation on the lower jaw or swelling on the face. So, you know, evaluating that facial symmetry is important. Um, packing feed. My daughter has a friend who has a mare who's notoriously difficult to bit. And I came one day because she was doing her best giraffe impression and I helped the girls bid her. And I noticed she was chewing. She was like, she was packing snooze between her upper incisors and her gum. And when I peeled that back, she had two open pulp cavities on her first two incisors. How ingenious that she packed feed in that spot. And so the nuances of the physical exam, as Karina you know, alluded to, sometimes we have to observe these little pieces. When I flush out the mouth, oh, no food on the left. Oh, lots of food on the right. Were you packing on that side? Were you chewing, observing all, and, and things that you can observe. And again, changes in behavior when bridling. So those are fairly outward. And, and some of those truly are welfare. If you notice a horse or your horse has those, those are health concerns that should be addressed in a very timely fashion. Now, how to recognize dental troubles that aren't necessarily 
the things health-wise we expect. These are maybe more the, the realm of the stomatonathic system. These are more the realm of the occlusal equilibration where an angle difference can cause a scoliosis in rats. There's a study in rats that shows an angle difference in the arcades changes the alignment of the spine. So horses that maybe have imbalances of those natures may chew fine, they may bit fine, but they might have troubles giving this way because the jaw doesn't move because there's just a catch, a catch. It doesn't need to be thicker than a piece of paper. Maybe they're unable to actually lift and collect because they have just a little hook at the very back of their mouth that won't move. Sometimes they're switching leads behind or they're tossing their head. They may be resistant to collection, break at the pole, invert. They may have an abnormal head carriage. I had a client just recently, her horse, instead of turning, he just broke at the pole and bent. And when we looked, he had an ever so slight shear in his little incisors. Um, tongue out during work, and this is kind of one of our, our classics here is, and I heard this today, mouth is just open when work, There's, it's gaping. And this goes back to that pressure point as well. You wouldn't close your mouth if you didn't have to, if you have pressure. So, if you notice any of the steps, or if you notice any of the symptoms, whether it's a, a general medical or whether something that we've said twigs in terms of he can't, he can't, can't keep the canter lead behind or he can't bend, the next steps are to contact your veterinarian and really schedule an in-depth oral exam for diagnosis and planning. And you know, I, I look, um, I'm glad I had the opportunity to go to Idaho and I'm glad I had the opportunity to have access to tools beyond what I had experienced before because I hand floated one horse in vet school and I knew that wasn't for me. I knew that was not what I was going to do. Um, and even when I went to Idaho and had the opportunity to work with that equipment, the exam becomes so much more incredible in terms of what you can see. And I think that Karina really hit the hit the nail on the head for me in a couple places. And one of them that was really profound was recognizing pathology. You know, so often we accept that 98, my dog is just attacking the futon for anyone that's wondering she's not dying. Um, we just don't recognize pathology because the prevalence is 90, 80, 100% at times. I mean, 98% of racehorses have gastric ulcers. That's life. Maybe we can edit that out. Anyway, the point I wanna make is having in the opportunity to have the tools the good gags, the, the, the lights, the mirrors, the pics. And like I said to Ryan, does Santa want to bring me a dental endoscope, right? After we've identified the pathology, looking at, does this horse need a dental float? Does it need a dental equilibration? What does it need? I have some patients, particularly geriatrics, when the teeth start to come out and they rattle, I think they'd rather be hand floated. No one's getting on to ride. There isn't a bit going in their mouth. So looking at these considerations, um, changes in diet or roughage recommendations as well, particularly in our diastomas or our geriatric horses, if we can take down pressure, we can improve longevity of the tooth. And I think that was one of the cruxes. You know, you're at the right place when the instructor starts speaking and you're glad you're there. And that's how I felt when I heard Dr. Nick Moore lecture in Idaho. And the comment of it's all about pressure was really, like I say, I just, I keep acknowledging that because think about you biting on the paper at your dentist's office, thickness of a piece of paper. So once you've identified this and you figure out what you're gonna do for floating and how it's gonna affect the diet or the bidding or the working, how can rehab help? Because Remember, I ended up in dentistry because I really liked the, the approach of rehabilitation. So what does rehab look like? And this is save the date, February 17th. We're gonna have part two of our dental month uh, celebrations and dentistry education. We're gonna have a dental rehab webinar. So what does dental rehabilitation look like? And ultimately our goals are pain relief, 
blood flow and tension release. So tension in muscles, tension in fascia. Um, for anyone who's ever tuned into any of our rehab talks before, you know I love K-tape. Um, and this is one of my favorite ways to K-tape. Now I will suggest or look at K-taping for two reasons. Sometimes our horses, when we're floating them, particularly if they've had imbalances, particularly if they have pathology, they're painful. I don't know if any dentists are on here, any veterinarians who float and they're really painful and they wanna to toss their head. Do they have pain in their TMJ? Do they have tension in their jaw? Can we relieve this pre-dentistry, post-dentistry? And I think that's a really cool thing about focusing on dental rehab is it might reduce the sedation we need even. It might make our patients more comfortable. So kinesiology taping, a client sent me this. It's just a little bit lower than what I tend to do, but it helps relieve tension in the masseter muscle. Um, sure foot pads, again, if you followed our Wednesday webinars before, you know Penny has talked about our sure foot pads, but the connection between the landing gear, the TMJ, stimulating that foot, those all those nerve cells, proprioceptors in the foot will be integrated centrally and help this relax. Low level laser therapy, great for pain relief and blood flow. Far infrared, I'm a back on track, hands bow sport, any of those therapeutic uh, wraps and bandages can be helpful. And this over here is something we've really started playing with. And when I say we, of course, I mean Penny, she brings all great things to our rehab department. And this is, this is a special one. This is a, a horse, that, it's not a dentistry, but I illustrate this because you know, if we look at her face, this is a very thinking eye. Um, and this is a mare who has a hard time being in her skin and being still. And when we offer cranial compression, again, particularly when we're power floating and we're putting vibration through there, this will help dampen some of that vibration and similar to a thunder shirt in the way it works. And of course, always complimentary for many ways, uh, acupuncture, chiropractic, cranial sacral, et cetera. And I will invite Dr. Cooper and uh, our rehab coiner Penny to join us. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, we would uh, love to have some dialogue and uh, answer anything we can. Okay, I think, I think I've unmuted Dr. Cooper. Are you there? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Uh, camera's not working, but that's okay. Any questions, welcome to in. Oh, shoot. You just muted her. It just muted her again. I was trying to find her camera. That's Sorry. quite all right. Any it's questions? Okay. Though? We can. Um, I did have one question in the chat and I think I answered it, but you, you two may know more than I do. Um, the question was, uh, what is the estimated time when you can offer the occlusal e equilibration? Um, I indicated it kind of depended on when the U.S. border opens and we can get back down there for more training, but I don't know if, um, if the two of you have any other insights for our viewers. Uh, my goal was to have the dental occlusal equilibration training completed this year. COVID's obviously delayed that, so my goal at this point in time is 2022. Um, equipment and all that is not the trick. It is, as I said, I'm not comfortable using the equipment until I have the skills to be able to use them well. And that's the reason why I have chosen to put the brakes on the occlusal offerings. But that said, we're still using the theory. We're still using the application to the best of our abilities, using the floating equipment that we have available to us. And as uh, Jody mentioned, we're using also our improved knowledge to improve our dental examination so that we can recognize some of those problems that we may not have even been aware of before and nip them in the bud before they become a big problem that we would have recognized previously. Agreed. Uh, it looks like Carol has her hand up, so I'm gonna unmute you, Carol. Let me just see here, I just, I think you can, un yeah, there we go. Hi, um, how often do you think we should have our te or horse's teeth checked? Oh, Carol, I know what Carol this is. Yes, you do. You have an adorable <laughs> little pony that you, no, yeah, I know. Excuse me, not the word. You know she's a horse. Icelandic <laughs> yes. horse. Yes, adorable, <laughs> but nonetheless. I'm uh, joking. <laughs> no. 
uh, for, for me, typically, uh, what I suggest in younger horses, so because there's so many transitional changes, like Karina said, with caps coming and caps going and here and there, and the other part is their teeth are just a little bit softer. And so generally, uh, I say to you about every eight months, but depending what's in there, right? Yeah. Yes. After that, but as Karina, you know, Dr. Cooper acknowledged, what kind of living circumstances? Generally, we say annually, but mm -hmm. I see some horses that are able to graze on pasture, to have their head down, to be moving and nipping and pulling and having normal jaw movement go multiple years with only needing sharp points, right? Okay. I, I traditionally do once a year, but, um, and also another question, do you like uh, cubes being fed or do you prefer hay? It depends. I was going to say, Karina, do you have any other comments on the floating schedule? Yeah, so the floating schedule has kind of been a convenient thing. We like to look at horses at least annually doing their vaccines, a physical examination, and the dentistry kind of followed in that same vein. So it became more of a convenience thing than anything else. Absolutely, though, if we're seeing a horse that has a pathology, we will recommend more frequent floating, if for no other reason than to address that pathology. Unfortunately, we can't fix major changes in the mouth all at once. We do have to do them gradually, allow the tooth to grow, allow the tooth to heal, and then we can make some more changes. So if your horse has had issues before, do not be surprised if we say that we want to see them in three or six months. And then if a horse has no issues, as uh, Jody had mentioned, we will see them six months, one year, or sometimes even two years if the horse has actually got a very balanced mouth or is eating rough enough food where they're not developing sharp points that are painful. So it is very situation dependent. Thank you. And as for your hay cube question, hay cubes are another means to an end. I like them for horses that have, for example, diastemas or, or gaps in their teeth because it takes less force to eat, which means you're going to have less food being pushed into that diastema. So I will use them as a treatment um, in the time to allow that diastema or that gap between the teeth to heal. The other time that I prefer to use hay cubes is as the teeth start to wear out and the older horses aren't able to chew anymore, they don't have the luxury of a grinding surface and a pre-chopped hay means they have that much less work to do. But in a young horse that has all of its factions and all of its teeth and enamel available to them, the hay cubes are a convenience. They're a great way of providing moisture, but they're not necessarily necessary for a dietary or dental chewing point of view. She said. <laughs> okay, ladies, we have one more question from Rochelle. Hello, Rochelle. Uh, what age do you suggest for a young horse to start fitting? And I can unmute you if you would like to elaborate on that. There, am I unmuted? You are. Oh, there. Yeah, so um, I just wondered if there was um, like too early of an age. I understand like it definitely helps to have the wolf teeth taken out before you start bidding in most cases. But um, otherwise, are there any other things that you'd like to see for the horse to wait to develop in its mouth before you start bidding them? Or once you know that they've had um, an assessment and their wolf teeth are out, um, is it okay to just go ahead and start um, bidding the horse. I, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, you get two for, for the one question today, Rochelle. Um, for me, the, the initial exam is key, right? So once I've seen a mouth, evaluated a mouth, been able to do what work needs to be done in there, wolf teeth, if they need to go, can go. Um, after that, I'm, I'm happy. I, I don't suggest putting a bit in the mouth before an evaluation, just because I've seen so many young horses, you know, they've, they've had one big hook on one side from a cap, or they've had one cap fragment on another side. And I think we can really confuse behavior or training issues if, if we don't check this off and know they're okay. And I would agree with that. That's the biggest thing when it comes to bidding young horses is that they are actually responding to the bit and the training, not to something else that is bothering them. 
So we need to set them up for success. And one of those things is to make sure that everything mechanical in the mouth is as it should be. And then I did have uh, one other question just regarding uh, nose bands and drop nose bands use on horses. Um, have you guys done any research or seen any issues uh, regarding uh, overuse or over tightening of those nose bands to cause uh, trouble in the mouth, like eventually causing ramps or the way that they're being used to actually cause some issues in the mouth? I haven't heard of any issues being caused from the nose band. However, my question is, why did you have to tighten the nose band in the first place? Why is your horse averting and behaving that way in the first place? So the consequences to nose banding that I have seen most have actually been indentations in the bony structures, especially if the nose band has been used on a younger animal. Um, or if, you know, even halter sizes uh, aren't appropriately adjusted as the horses grow. Um, but my question would be more, okay, so we have a nose band or we've decided that we need it because the nose band is used for aversion or to keep the mouth closed or to keep them from chewing on their bit. And that's as much as I'm going to say on that matter, because that is a can of worms that goes to the rehab department. And they're the ones that usually investigate those further. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of loaded because I sometimes provide Rochelle and I have discussed this for a while and, and we know that nose bands affect mechanics. Um, we know that. And so I, I think I go back to Karina too. I think that really they are a, a symptom of a deeper issue of some kind of mechanical or pathological issue in the mouth. And um, yeah, that's Penny, do you wanna weigh in? You're muted. Do you have an opinion? Any two cents? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I think there's a reason why they have um, FEI and whatnot has has uh, legislated that you be able to get two fingers or two or three fingers or whatever it is um, under the nose band. It's it's it doesn't it, it shouldn't be that tight. It's it's not helpful for the horse. <laughs> in my humble opinion. And science would support you. I think it's a welfare issue and a, and a science supported issue, issue. Yes. yes. Agreed. All right, does anyone else have any questions? Thank you, Rochelle, those are great questions. If not, we've had just some comments just saying thank you and great presentation. And uh, I will echo that. So I'll have to watch it again later when I'm not monitoring for questions and letting people in, but um, lots of great information there. Thank you both for taking all the time you've done to put this together, because I know it's a lot of work. And as Jody said, stay tuned for February 17th, um, where we do a follow-up uh, seminar. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some rehab, which is of course near and dear to our hearts. And we thank you all for joining us on this Wednesday evening and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.